right, so let's take a look at the uh, last part of section 6.3. And it's a good review of what we've done over the past two days because it's going to combine graphing multiple transformations into the same problem. Um, the nice thing about doing this is you really don't have to do anything different. You just have to do the transformations in a certain order. All right. So there's four transformations. And the first transformation you always do is a phase shift. And so we deal with the left and right movement of the function first. The next transformation you would deal with after that is your period change. Notice both of these are the horizontal transformations. Shifting left and right, stretching left and right. So you deal with all the horizontal stuff first. Okay. The next thing is a vertical stretch. Now, when you deal with the vertical stretch, something else can happen. And we studied that. Does anybody remember what else can happen? And we studied it with vertical stretches, yeah? Yeah, you could have a reflection. So you do that if necessary. And in terms of, well, should I stretch it and then reflect it, or should I reflect it and then stretch it? It doesn't matter. As long as you do both of these transformations, if necessary, in the same step. But it doesn't matter which one you do first. Yes. Yep. And then the last transformation you do is the vertical shift. This is the exact same order we've been studying all year with every function we've done. Okay, so if you wanted to see it um, kind of written out. So let's see, your phase shift is first. Your period change is second. Your vertical stretch is third. And your vertical shift is fourth. Okay, so I put the letters in the order of which one you do. A, B, C, and then D. Um, let me make sure. Did I make a mistake? Phase shift, <coughs> period change, vertical stretch. Nope, I don't think I made a mistake, but go ahead. Is the vertical stretch the same as the amplitude change? Yeah, vertical stretch, that's, that's an amplitude change. That's, what, that's the effect a vertical stretch has. It changes the amplitude. Mm -hmm. So the phase change and the period change are horizontal, right? They're um, horizontal shifts, so the Yep, these, these are both horizontal. So they're like where the X, where, where the mobile X on the, uh, on the problem, right? Um, so what was your question? Yeah, it involves the X axis. Change. It involves the X axis, yep. Horizontal, change the X values. The other two change the Y values. Yep. Okay, so if C was negative, that's where you get the reflection. Um, if A is negative, well, that just changes the direction you're shifting left and right. If D is negative, that just changes the direction up to down. Um, B, we said that won't be negative. All right, so we'll, we'll try some problems where we have to do multiple transformations and just keep that, that order in mind. All right, so let's just start by identifying how many transformations we have and um, what they are. So how many transformations in this problem? Two. Okay. What uh, is the first one we're going to do? Nick? Phase shift. We're going to do a phase shift. And then what about the two in front? Vertical stretch. That's a vertical stretch. All right. So the two that we do, we do them exactly in the order that, that Nick said. Do the phase shift first. Right. So this time we're going to have two tables. I'm going to pretend like this is my problem Okay, for now. And then when I get the answer to this, then I'll do the second part. Okay, so let's start with our table. Okay, what values stay the same when we're dealing with a phase shift? The y's. So we got 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. Now I'm going to take all my x's. And that's 3 pi over 2. And what do I do with all those x values? 
Yep, we have to. We're going to subtract pi over 2. Anything that has a denominator of 2, those we can do pretty quick. Or well, the first one we can also do pretty quick. What's 0 minus pi over 2? No, negative. negative pi over 2. Pi over 2 minus pi over 2? Zero. 0. And now the next one is pi minus pi over 2. What's the common denominator? 2. So double the bottom, double the top. What's 2 pi over 2? Take away 1 pi over 2. Pi over 2. Next one already has a common denominator. 3 pi over 2, take away 1 pi over 2. 2 pi over 2, which we can reduce to just pi. So, and the last one, yep, yeah, it would be 4 pi over 2, take away 1 pi over 2, which is 3 pi over 2. So there's your, there's your table for your phase shift. Okay. Any questions on, on that? So if it makes it clear, I can label this table sine x plus pi over 2. That's, that's not the final answer. All right, so now we're going to take that table and create our final table. Okay. What, um, the last thing I'm doing is a vertical stretch. What values are going to stay the same this time? The x's. So copy down your x's from the previous table. Don't go back to the original. Okay, if you go all the way back to the original, you're going to undo your phase shift. So keep the x's. 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. And what am I going to do to all my y values? Yeah, just take all your y values and double them. So you get 0, 2, 0, negative 2, 0. That's the final table. Okay, just like any other problem, get one point for each x and y you get right. Any questions on that? Okay, so now we graph it. Look at my, my grid. Um, the highest and lowest I need to go for the y-axis is 2 and negative 2. For my x's, I'm just going to space everything equally. So I've got negative pi over 2, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. Is there any questions why I didn't have to skip any lines there? You don't have to skip, because okay, this is going by 90s. The first one is negative 90, 0. 90, 180, 270. Usually when you skip over 0, that happens when you use pi over 4. That's, that's when you need to skip when you're making your uh, labeling your axes. Okay. But no, no skipping anything here. Um, so we got negative pi over 2, 0. 0, 2. Pi over 2, 0. Uh, negative 2. And back to zero. There's my graph. Um, what's the what's the amplitude here? If I asked that question. Yep, the amplitude is two. Um, what about the period? Okay, and yes it is. That length of the period is from negative pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. How long is that interval? How long? 90. Um, it's 90 from just here to here. That's 90. It is 360 or 2 pi radians. We didn't do anything to change the period in this problem. Okay, the period of that graph is the original period because it wasn't stretched or compressed horizontally. <coughs> Great. Any questions on that? Now, technically here, how many transformations did we do on the x-axis? One. One. How many on the y? One. One. Whenever you do two transformations and they're on separate axes, technically you can do them in any order you want. 
okay? Because you're only doing one to the x and you're only doing one to the y. When you get into transformations where you have two on the same axis, like maybe you're going to shift it up and then you're going to stretch it vertically, then it makes a difference, okay? So when you start doing multiple transformations on one axis, you've got to do it in the order that I said. But if you just stick with that order all the time, then you'll, you'll always be all set. Okay, and the reason it, it makes a difference is just think of PEMDAS. Think about like if I want to double a number and then add five. Well, the order you do that in makes, makes a difference. Pick a number, 10. If you double it first and then add five, that's totally different than adding five and then doubling it. You get two different answers. Okay, so that's, that's why you just have to be careful. Okay, how many transformations here? Two. Um, and what uh, is the first transformation? It's a period change, so let's deal with that. So the y's are going to stay the same. And what am I going to do to all of my x values? Yes. Divide them by 2 or multiply them by a half. Okay, so the first one is going to be 0. Next one, pi over 4. How about the next one? Pi over 2. Yep. How about uh, the fourth one? 3 pi over 4. And the last one? Pi. So the increments here is it's going up by 45 degrees. 0, 45, 90, 135, 180. Okay. So that is um, cosine 2x. Now we're going to transform that table into 3 cosine 2x. Okay. What's, um, what's the 3 going to do? It's a vertical stretch. So we're going to, how do we deal with that vertical stretch? What's the arithmetic I need to do? Yeah, keep the x's the same. I have a 4. Pi over 2, pi over 4, and pi. And now we're going to multiply all the y's by 3. So 3, 0, negative 3, 0, 3. That's your final answer. Okay. Any questions on that table? Okay, when I set up my graph, um, am I going to have to skip anything here? No, because I'm using 0. Okay, generally, you only have to skip, or one of the times you don't have to skip is when you don't use 0, but I am using it, 0, 3. Okay, so I'm going to use that, I'm not skipping it. And then I'm spacing everything pi over 4 radians apart, okay, or 45 degrees apart. So pi over 2. Pi over 4 and pi. And again, looking at those fractions, most people wouldn't see a pattern, but it's because they don't have the same denominator. It's 0 pi over 4, 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4. Okay, so there, there is a pattern. All right, and for my y axis, I need to go from negative 3 to 3. As I walked around, some people asked me, well, is it okay if my graphs look the same? Um, and they will if you change your scale. Okay. If you're changing your scale all the time, which is fine, then a lot of the pictures look the same. All right. Got 0, 3. Uh, pi over 4, 0. Negative 3, 0. Back to 3. Okay. And try to connect that as 
know, as smooth as you can with a curve. And there's your graph. Great. Any questions on that one? All right. Um, does anyone need to see another one of those? It's pretty much the same idea. You just, as long as you understand the individual transformations, you should be able to do any combination that I give you. Just do it one step at a time. Okay. And you could have a problem that has four transformations in it. Technically, it's possible, uh, but I don't think I end up giving you one um, in the homework tonight. What's that? A bonus problem? That'd be a good bonus problem. I, w I don't even give one that complicated as a bonus. But you could do it. All right, so this one's asking me to find a complete graph. What does that mean? What am I, what am I doing when they say find a complete graph? A window. I'm doing it on a calculator. Okay. So find a complete graph of 4 sine 3x. And then tell me the domain, the range, the amplitude, and the period. So we've talked a lot about period and amplitude this week. Um, we didn't do as much with domain and range, but we should remember from hopefully what you know, the other functions we've studied, and we'll apply it to this one. All right, so bring up my calculator. <coughs> I'm going to type in 4 sine 3x. Okay, and what I'm going to do for now is just hit zoom 7. Okay, is that a complete graph? Yeah. Yeah, if you say no, then you have to tell me something important that I'm not seeing. Um, technically, I can see everything on the screen. I can see the highest, I can see the lowest. And I can see that it just keeps repeating. Um, I generally don't like to have my highest and lowest value right on the very edge of the screen. I like to leave a little bit of extra space just so I can really you know, be absolutely positive that that was the highest and the lowest. Okay. So that, that's a complete graph. Technically, what I had before was also a complete graph. OK, so when they ask you to find a complete graph, I'm looking for those values. Uh, that was a negative. OK, so I want these and those. The X mins and maxes, the Y mins and max. And if you rounded this off, you just said, you know, negative 9 to 9, that's fine. Uh, you don't even have to show that much. Uh, you're showing that it repeats like, a lot of times. Okay. You really don't even have to show it to me that many times. Okay, right now I'm probably seeing like six or seven periods on the screen. As long as I can see at least two, that, that I'd be happy with that. All right. So now let's see if we can find all, everything they're asking for. Okay, what's, um, what's the domain? What, function, what numbers are you allowed to plug in for x? Yeah, you can plug in all real numbers. You can take any number you want and triple it, and then take the sine of that number. Sine is a continuous function. There's no asymptotes you have to worry about. So the domain for every single sine function is all real numbers. The only way that couldn't happen is if you did something where you put sine in the bottom of a fraction. Well, technically, that's not sine anymore. That's cosecant. Okay, if you flip sine, you get the cosecant. The domain here is not all real numbers. Okay, but for today, we're not talking about cosecant. Okay, if you wanted to write it as an interval, you could put negative infinity to infinity. Same thing. Um, how about the range? Is the range negative infinity to infinity? No. There's limits on this. And if you're not sure, you could do second calc max <coughs> and min. But from looking at the problem, you, you should kind of know. Yeah, including it or not including? Yes, yeah, so you will reach negative 4 and positive 4. 
So we've got the domain, the range. Okay. What's the amplitude here? Four. The amplitude is just a single number. And period. Um, what's the formula to find the period? It was a fraction. T equals 2 pi over B. 2 pi over B. And what's B in this case? 3. Three. There's your period. So in other words, what I could do is if I said to you, I want you to graph this and only show me one period, you would need to graph something on the screen that was only this big, 2 pi over 3 units, from min to max. So one way I could do that makes x min 0, make x max 2 pi over 3. Now what I've just done is I've set a width on my screen of exactly 2 pi over 3 units. So when you graph it, you'll see exactly one period. Now, what if I wanted to see two cycles on the screen? What could I change my x max to? Four, two. Yeah, I could just take the, the previous period and double it. Okay, if you want to see double, make the window twice as, twice as long. So if you make it 4 pi over 3. Okay, we haven't stretched or compressed the graph at all. All I've done is I've zoomed the screen out so you're seeing more of it. <coughs> now you're seeing two full cycles. Right, so they're going to have you do stuff like that a lot. They'll have to say, find a window where you see exactly two cycles on the screen. Okay, and that's not the only way to do it. Okay, that's just the way I chose to do it. Okay. All right, let's try this one. Um, same type of graph, same type of problem, just a uh, different graph. Find the domain range period and asymptotes of 3 sine <coughs> x minus 1. Let's go back and do the complete graph after. Let's see if we can figure out some of these things without the picture. What's the domain? All real numbers. All real numbers, yep. What about my range? What's the highest and the lowest this one will go? Yeah, it would be 3 to negative 3. Um, how about the, let's do the amplitude. Amplitude is 3 and the period. It's 2 pi over 1. Okay, this is the number, this is b in this case. It's just a 1. So the period is just 2 pi. Can anybody think of a case where the, the range and the amplitude wouldn't involve the same numbers? Like this time it had 3s and negative 3s. Last time it had 4s and negative 4s. Anybody think when these wouldn't use the same numbers? Well, we changed the amplitude here, though. And I could also ask the same, a different question, and it has the same answer to the one I just asked. Can anybody think of a time when the range wouldn't be like a number and then the negative of that number? Like 4, negative 4, 2, negative 2. It might be a time when it's not the number and the opposite of the number. Yeah, if you did a vertical shift, okay, you could have something like this. So now maybe your range is from 1 to 3. Okay? And the amplitude there would be 1. Okay? The amplitude is the highest the graph goes off that center line. Okay? So that's an amplitude 1, but the range is 1 to 3. Okay? So any question on that? Because right, I just didn't want to get in the habit of always writing that quickly without thinking about it a little bit. All right, let's find a um, complete graph of 3 sine x minus 1. 3 sine x minus 1. So I already know it goes from 3 to negative 3. Um, so I could leave my window like that, or I could, I could bring it in a little bit. Let's bring it from negative 4 to 4. 
Um, and let's say I want to see two cycles on the screen. Yeah, that means I need a window that's four pi units wide. I don't care how you do it, just somehow the difference between the x min and the x max has to be four pi. So what's one way I could, I could do that? Yeah, 0 to 4 pi. And that will show me a window that is exactly two cycles. It ends right where it starts. Um, what's another way I could do it? Instead of 0 to 4 pi, give me another window that is still 12, 12 and a half units wide. Yeah? Because um, in this case, I just said, show me a window that's two cycles wide. Oh. The problem didn't say that. But I'm just practicing it. Yeah? I make your x min 2 pi and your x max 2 pi. Well, if the min and the max are the same, then your window would be nothing. Oh, well, negative 2 pi. And yeah. Min and then. If you did negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi, that's perfectly acceptable to show me a window that's two cycles wide. Okay? You're just showing me some of the negative part of the graph now. Right? So unless the problem specifically says what to do, you don't have to worry too much about the window. Okay? But eventually, we're going to have to start finding certain windows. Okay. So any questions on that? So I'm going to do that as my answer this time. That's a, that's a complete graph. And it happened to show two cycles. Okay. What I don't want you to do on a complete graph is show less than one full cycle. Okay. That's not a complete graph. You've got to see one full cycle at a minimum. I like to do at least two. All right, so let's um, look at solving some trig equations on the calculator. Um, not even going to say anything. Uh, I just want you to look at that and see if you can tell me what to do. You, you've done the process to solve this, you've done before. We've just always done it with algebraic functions. Okay. Now we're doing it with trig functions. Anybody think they know what, what I have to do to use the calculator to solve this? Sam, do you have any, any thoughts? Think about what does a calculator do, like a graphing calculator in particular? What, what's the advantage of a graphing calculator? It shows me graphs. Okay. It, it shows me graphs. Yes, it can also show me tables. It can do lots of other things too. But the main thing that we focus on is that it can show you graphs. All right. So does that give you a, a hint? Okay, you could. Um, you can do that, and that, that would work. Or you can, for this one, you could actually leave it just the way it is and, and do something. I'll do it the way you suggested after if, if people want to see it. But do you see how you could do it leaving it just the way it is here? Nope. Anyone else have a thought? Yeah? Um, could you do the sign of x in one y? Yeah. If you want to know where two things are equal, okay, graphically that just means where do they cross. So put sine of x in y1, put 0.4 in y2. I'm going to check my window. Um, I know sine of x, that's between 1 and negative 1. So I don't, I don't need to go as high as I'm going here. And what's the period for sine x? Two pi. So really, 
I only need to go from 0 to 2 pi. But I'm going to go beyond 2 pi just to show you something. I'm going to go to 4 pi. So you're going to see two cycles on the graph. And they want to know where that is equal to 0.4. Now, if I kept graphing this, how many times would it be equal to 0.4? Infinite. Infinite. So there is a way we can write all the answers just by finding the first two. Right? And then basically, if this is an answer, how far away is the next answer? 2 pi. Every answer is 2 pi units away from that. Okay? If you know this answer, the next one is plus 2 pi, plus 6.28. And then the next answer is plus another 6.28. And it also goes back the other way. Okay? There's an infinite number of answers in each direction. But in this problem, they didn't ask for an infinite number of answers. What did they tell me very specifically to do? Find all solutions in the given interval. So they want you to write every single answer in the interval. What's the interval they told me to be in here? Greater than zero but less than two pi. Right. So since there's an infinite number of answers, they've narrowed it down in this problem. They don't want all the answers, just the ones between zero and two pi. So that's a hint what you should set your window to. Set your window from zero to two pi, and then you won't see anything else. Now, how do I get both of those answers? Yeah, okay. you got to do an intersect and you got to do it twice. Second calc intersect. I'll do the one to the right. Um, we get two point seven three. And does anybody have the other one? No. So second calc intersect again. This time I have to move closer to the other one. Just as always, the guess has to be closer to the one you want. Um, 0 0.41. And there's your two answers. Now, I want to um, show you something else. Everyone thought about how long it took me to do that, right? To set my window, I had to graph each function, and then I had to do second calc intersect, and I did it twice. So maybe if I did all that from start to finish, I could do it in probably 40 to 50 seconds, typing all that in and writing it down. Um, I could also do this. I don't know if you're timing me, but that probably took me about five seconds. And notice the answer I got, 0 0.41, 0 0.41. So eventually, we're going to talk about a way to solve these things without using a graph. And it's not that hard. It's like that. The only thing I have to figure out is, well, where's the other answer? How would you get this 2.73 from this 0.41? Um, and, and there is a way to do that. Um, for now, we don't have to worry about it. I can show you the calculation. It ends up just being pi minus 0.41, 2.73. That's the other answer. So there's a very, very fast way to do this without graphing which we'll get to eventually. And I just want you to know that there's other ways to do this. But we'll stick with this for, for now. All right. When graphing comes in handy is when I get something that's so complicated I can't solve it with algebra. Then graphing will always work. Because okay? I could definitely make up some problems here that I couldn't do with algebra. I'd have to graph it. Okay. Um, so what's going to be the strategy for this one. How am I going to solve that equation? Nick? Put 2 cosine 1 half x. Yep. I'm going to type it as 0.5 just because it's easier for me on the calculator. Put in, uh, 1 .5 yep. Doesn't matter which one I put where. Basically all I'm checking is where these two things do what? Cross. Yeah, where they cross, where they intersect. Okay, now I know this one is going to have a different amplitude than the last one. What's the amplitude of 2 cosine 1 half x? 2. So I could leave my window where it is, but I'm just, I just don't like it to have it right on the edge. 
Okay, so I'm going to put it negative 3 to 3. And they're telling me to find all the answers between um, well, I guess you can write it that way. I usually write it this way. That's the same thing. So you're finding all answers between no, it has to be written that way. Yeah, the top way doesn't make sense. Because if you did that, that's saying to find all answers that are less than 0 and bigger than 6.28. You can't find answers that are smaller than 0 and bigger than 6. It doesn't work. Um, so on the test, the uh, <coughs> interval will be written <coughs> correctly. All right, so 0 to 2 pi. Now, what would happen if this 2 wasn't here? What would be the amplitude of cosine 1 half x? 1. Now, if it only went as high as 1, when would it hit 1 and a half? It wouldn't. So you, if that 2 wasn't there, you'd have something that looks like this, trying to see where they cross. It wouldn't work. Okay. But because the 2 is there, um, it is going to work. And this time, there is only one answer in the interval they wanted me to find. So that answer right there, just calculate your intersect. All right, so we get uh, 1.44 comma, well, 1.5. So it's, yeah, 1.44. And again, that's in radians. If you wanted to do this in degrees, you'd change your mode to degrees. That's one way to do it. Or just change this answer to degrees. Okay, if you say, well, how many degrees is that? I could just square this. And that would convert 1.44 radians to degrees. Okay, but I'm just, I'm just going to do it in radians. Okay, any questions on that one? All right, so here's one that's a little more complicated. You might still be able to figure out a way to use um, algebra to do it. But now you're trying to find where two trig functions cross each other. So now you've got two curves at the same time. Where do they cross? Right. So how many answers do you think I could have here? Well, they're, they're, if they cross at least once, there would be infinite answers if you look forever left and right, as long as they cross at least once. But here we're going to look at a small <laughs> window, just 0 to 2 pi. Um, well, if you've got these two curves, I guess maybe, yeah, you could come up with something that never crosses at all, depending on how the curves look. Let's say you had a curve that did this, and then you had another curve that did this. If all you're focusing on is this window, maybe, maybe they do cross right here, but maybe they don't cross ever again. Or maybe they don't. Maybe it's, maybe it's actually shifted a little bit to the left, so they just barely don't cross in that window. So they might not cross at all, but you could also get something where they cross um, a ton of times. If you have this as a graph, we could have all kinds of intersection points. So the only way to tell is just to graph it. Right, so let's, um, let's see what this looks like. So we've got 3 cosine 1 half x. So I'll just keep that one there. And <coughs> 2 sine x. OK. Which function is going to go higher? Um, the cosine or the sine function? Cosine. Yep, cosine. And how high does it go? Three. Yeah, it goes up to 3. So I'm going to set my min and max just a little bigger. Negative 4 to 4. And they told me 0 to 2 pi. I already have that in from the last problem.